You are listening to the Adult Sabbath School Lessons for the third quarter of 2022. This is lesson number five of the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide in the Crucible with Christ. This lesson is titled Extreme Heat and is ready for teaching on July 30. The author is Pastor Gavin Anthony, who was conference president in Iceland when he wrote this series of lessons. Today, your lesson is read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, July 23. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again we come to open your word and before doing so we ask for your presence with us. We ask for your Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds, to make the words come alive, that the message here for us today and through this week will be one that will stay with us and influence us, but also one that we can share with those around us. Because as we learn to face the major issues that occur in our own individual lives and in our corporate lives. We pray that we will have the strength and the courage and the grace that comes from you to relate to others in such a way that they will know that we have been with Jesus through everything that we encounter. And Lord, today I'd like to pray for those who are listening in Istanbul in Turkey, to those in the Virgin Islands and St. Lucia in the Caribbean, to those listening in San Antonio in Texas and Nukalofa in Tonga, to Gabon in Botswana and Khartoum in Sudan, to Karachi in Pakistan, to those listening in Shanghai in China and Gatton in Australia. Lord, bless each of us, we pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text for this week is Isaiah 53, verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Let's read that again. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand hand. As the wife of the famous Christian writer C.S. Lewis was dying, Lewis wrote, and this is recorded in A Grief Observed, page 6 and 7, Not that I am, I think, in much danger of ceasing to believe in God. The real danger is of coming to believe such dreadful things about him. The conclusion I dread is not, so there's no God after all, but so this is what God's really like. End of quote. When things become really painful, some of us reject God completely. For others, like Lewis, there is the temptation to change our view of God and imagine all sorts of bad things about Him. The question is, just how hot can it get? How much heat is God willing to risk putting His people through in order to bring about His ultimate purpose of shaping us into the image of His Son? As we read in Romans 8.29, For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. And now for the week at a glance. Why do you think God is willing to risk being misunderstood by those he wants to know him and love him? How much do you think God is willing to be misunderstood in order to mould you into the image of his Son? Sunday, July 24. Abraham in the Crucible. Read Genesis chapter 22. Out of nowhere and without explanation, God suddenly calls Abraham to offer his own child as a burnt offering. Can you imagine how Abraham must have felt? 
It was a totally revolting idea that a holy God should request that he sacrifice his own son. Even if Abraham thought that this was acceptable, what about God's promises of an inheritance? Without his son, the promise would be gone. Let's read Genesis 22, beginning at verse 1. Now it came to pass, after these things, that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Now take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, the lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order, and he found Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, so he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, The Lord Will Provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice." So Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. Now it came to pass after these things that it was told to Abraham, saying, Indeed, Milcah also has borne children to your brother Nahor, Huz his firstborn, Buz his brother, Kemuel the father of Aram, Chesed, Hazo, Pildash, Lidlap, and Bethuel. And Bethuel begot Rebekah. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. His concubine, whose name was Ruma, also bore Teba, Gaham, Thahash, and Makkah. Why did God ask Abraham to offer this sacrifice? If God knows everything, what was the point? God's request and its timing were not random. Indeed, it was calculated to exact the deepest possible anguish. For as we read in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 147, God had reserved his last, most trying test for Abraham until the burden of years was heavy upon him and he longed for rest. End of quote. Was this the test of a mad God? Not at all, for as we read on page 154, the agony which he endured during the dark days of that fearful trial was permitted that he might understand from his own experience something of the greatness of the sacrifice made by the infinite God for man's redemption. End of quote. This was just a test. God never intended for Abraham to kill his son. 
This highlights something very important about the way God sometimes works. God may ask us to do something that he never intends for us to complete. He may ask us to go somewhere he never intends for us to arrive at. What is important to God is not necessarily the end, but what we learn as we are reshaped by the process. Jesus may have been thinking about Abraham's experience when he said to the Jews in John 8.56, Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. Abraham could have missed out on this insight, dismissing the instructions as from Satan. The key to Abraham's surviving and learning through the whole process was knowing God's voice. And so to finish today, how do you know the voice of God? How do you know when God is talking to you? What are the ways he communicates his will to you? Monday, July 25, Wayward Israel The story of Hosea has some powerful lessons to teach us. Hosea's situation is remarkable. His wife, Gomer, runs away and has children with other men. Though she is sexually unfaithful, God calls Hosea to take his wife back and fully show his love to her again. This story is meant as a parable about God and Israel. The Israelites had left God and were prostituting themselves spiritually to other gods, but God still loved them and wanted to show his love to them. But just look at God's methods. Read Hosea chapter 2 verses 1 to 12. What methods does God say he will use to pull Israel back to himself? What would these experiences have felt like? Let's read them. Hosea 2, verses 1 to 12. Say to your brethren, my people, and to your sisters, mercy is shown. Bring charges against your mother, bring charges, for she is not my wife, nor am I her husband. Let her put away her harlotries from her sight, and her adulteries from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and expose her, as in the day she was born, and make her like a wilderness, and set her like a dry land, and slay her with thirst. I will not have mercy on her children, for they are the children of harlotry, for their mother has played the harlot. She who conceived them has behaved shamefully, for she said, I will go after my lovers who give me bread and my water, my wool and my linen, my oil and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up your ways with thorns and wall her in so that she cannot find her paths. She will chase her lovers, but not overtake them. Yes, she will seek them, but not find them. Then she will say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then it was better for me than now. For she did not know that I gave her grain, new wine and oil, and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. Therefore I will return and take away my grain in its time, and my new wine in its season, and will take back my wool and my linen, given to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall deliver her from my hand. I will also cause all her mirth to cease. Her feast days, her new moons, her sabbaths, all her appointed feasts. And I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, of which she has said, These are my wages that my lovers have given me. So I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall eat them. What would these experiences have felt like, first of all, verses 2 and 3? Bring charges against your mother, bring charges, for she is not my wife, nor am I her husband. Let her put away her harlotries from her sight, and her adulteries from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and expose her, as in the day she was born, and make her like a wilderness, and set her like a dry land, and slay her with thirst, 
and verses 5 to 7. For their mother has played the harlot, she who conceived them has behaved shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers, who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my linen, my oil and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up your ways with thorns and wall her in, so that she cannot find her paths. She will chase her lovers, but not overtake them. Yes, she will seek them, but not find them. Then she will say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then it was better for me than now. Hosea chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 For she did not know that I gave her grain, new wine and oil, and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. Therefore I will return and take away my grain in its time, and my new wine in its season, and will take back my wool and my linen, given to cover her nakedness. And verse 10. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall deliver her from my hand. This story raises two important issues about the way we experience God when he is bringing us to repentance. First, we risk not recognizing that God is at work. When Israel went through such hard and painful experiences, it might have been hard for them to recognize that their God was working for their salvation. When our path is blocked by sharp thorns, or we are walled in so that we don't know where we are going, as we saw in verse 6, is this God? When our basic necessities disappear, or we are embarrassed, as in verses 9 and 10, could our Father be in the middle of it all? The truth is, that whatever we feel, God is always working to bring us to repentance because he loves us so very much. Second, we risk misunderstanding God when he is at work. We may recognize that God is at work, but we don't like what he's doing. While we are feeling hurt and embarrassed, it is easy to blame God for being cruel, for not intervening or for not caring. But God is always working to renew us through his covenant of love. And so to finish the day, read Hosea chapter 2, verses 14 to 23. What does this passage reveal about God? Ask the Holy Spirit to show you if you have been running from God in any area of your life. If you are convicted that you have been, why wait to go through the crucible? What's stopping you from surrendering all to the Lord now? So Hosea chapter 2, beginning at verse 14, Therefore, behold, I will allure her, will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her. I will give her her vineyards from there and the valley of Achor as a door of hope. She shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband, and no longer call me my master. For I will take from her mouth the names of the Baals, and they shall be remembered by their name no more. In that day I will make a covenant for them, with the beasts of the field, with the birds of the air, and with the creeping things of the ground. Bow and sword of battle I will shatter from the earth, to make them lie down safely. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. It shall come to pass in that day that I will answer, says the Lord. I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth. The earth shall answer with grain, with new wine, and with oil. And they shall answer Jezreel. Then I will sow her for myself in the earth, and I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. Then I will say to those who are not my people, You are my people. And they shall say, You are my God. Tuesday, July 26, Surviving Through Worship. Read Job chapter 1, verses 6, through to chapter 2, verse 10. What caused Job's suffering? 
Job 1, beginning at verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power, only do not lay a hand on his person." So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were ploughing and the donkeys feeding beside them when the Sabaeans raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels and took them away, yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people. And they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. Again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? Satan answered and the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil, and still he holds fast to his integrity? Although you incited me against him, to destroy him without cause. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a potsherd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? In all this Job did not sin with his lips." There's something astonishing here. The angels come to see God, and Satan comes with them. God asks Satan where he has been, and Satan replies that he has been roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then God poses this question, Have you considered my servant Job? The question itself is not remarkable. What is remarkable is the one who asks it. It isn't Satan who points out Job as a subject for examination, it's God. Knowing exactly what is going to follow, God calls Job to Satan's attention. Down on the earth, Job has absolutely no idea how hot his crucible is about to become. And though it's very clear that it is Satan, not God, who causes Job suffering, 
it also is clear that it is God who gives his explicit permission for Satan to destroy Job's possessions, children and his own physical health. If God is giving permission for Job to suffer, what difference does it make whether God or Satan is personally inflicting the suffering? How can God be righteous and holy when he actively allows Satan to cause Job such pain? Is this situation a special case, or is it characteristic of the way God still deals with us today? In Job 1 verses 20 and 21, how does Job respond to the trials? Verse 20, Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It is possible to respond to such sufferings in two ways. We can become bitter and angry, turning our backs on a God we believe to be cruel or non-existent, or we can hang on to God more tightly. Job deals with his catastrophe by staying in God's presence and worshipping him. In Job 1 verses 20 and 21, which we've just read, we see three aspects of worship that may help when in anguish. First, Job accepts his helplessness and recognises that he has no claim to anything. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. Second, Job acknowledges that God is still in total control. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Third, Job concludes by reasserting his belief in the righteousness of God. May the name of the Lord be praised, he said. And so to finish today, going through a trial? Follow the steps that Job used. How might they help you as well? Wednesday, July 27, Surviving Through Hope. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 in the New International Version reads, We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. As God's chosen apostle, Paul endured more than most people. Yet Paul was not crushed. Rather, he grew in his praise for God. Read his list of hardships in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 29. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labours more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews five times I have received forty stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches? Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble, and I do not burn with indignation? Now read Second Corinthians 1, 3 to 11. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. 
Now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or, if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast, because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and who does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us, you also helping together in prayer for us, that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. In 2 Corinthians 1 verse 4, Paul states that the reason for receiving God's compassion and comfort is so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. To what extent might suffering be a call to ministry? How could we become more alert to this possibility? God wants to minister through us to hurting people. This means that he may first allow us to experience the same sort of hurts. Then we'll offer encouragement not from theory, but from our own experience of the compassion and comfort of God. This is a principle from Jesus' life, as we read in Hebrews 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was, in all points, tempted as we are, yet without sin. Paul's vivid descriptions of his hardships are not to make us feel sorry for him. They are for us to know that even when we're in the depths, the Father still can intervene to bring his compassion and comfort. We may despair even of our own lives and even be killed, but fear not. God is teaching us to rely on him. We can trust him, for our God raises the dead, as we've just read in Second Corinthians 1 verse 9. As Paul continues to set his eyes on proclaiming the gospel, he knows that God will rescue him in the future as well. Paul's ability to remain firm is supported by three things he mentions in 2 Corinthians 1 verses 10 and 11. First, God's proven track record. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us. Second, Paul's determination to fix his concentration on God himself. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. And third, the saints' continual intercession as you help us by your prayers in verse 11. And so to finish the day, what can you learn from Paul that can help you keep from falling into self-pity amid your own struggles? Thursday, July 28. Extreme Heat So far this quarter we have considered many examples of the crucibles that God uses to bring purity and Christ-likeness to our lives. However, some people may view these examples and conclude that God is a severe and demanding taskmaster. Sure, some may say, we know that God wants something good for us, but these examples don't reveal much care and love. Instead, God looks more like a bully. He sets out with a purpose that causes us considerable hard times, and there's nothing we can do about it. It's true that while living on this sin-filled earth, we will understand only a little of why things happen. In heaven, we'll understand so much more. As you read in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. 
then each one's praise will come from God. And 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. But for now, we will have to live with the tension of believing that God is present and cares for us, even though things don't always feel too good. Isaiah describes this tension very well in Isaiah 43 verses 1 to 7. But now, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honoured, and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring you descendants from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. In verse 2, God says that his people will pass through waters and through fire. These are figurative of extreme dangers, but perhaps they hint at the crossing of the Red Sea and the Jordan, both fearful times, but times that paved the way to a new life. You may expect that God might say that he would protect his people from these dangers, that he would guide them along an easier route. But, like the shepherd in Psalm 23, he says rather that when the difficult times come, God's people need not be overwhelmed, for he is with them. Look back at Isaiah 43, 1-7. Write down the different ways in which God assures his people of comfort during the times of water and fire. What picture of God does this paint in your mind? Which promises can you claim for yourself? Let's read that again. Isaiah 43, beginning at verse 1. But now, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honoured, and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him, yes, I have made him. We can summarise what we've learned about God's crucibles in three ways. First, God's extreme heat is to destroy not us, but our sin. Second, God's extreme heat is not to make us miserable, but to make us pure, as we were created to be. Third, God's care for us through all things is constant and tender. He will never leave us alone, no matter what happens to us. And so to finish today, what do these texts teach you about the actions and character of God? How have you experienced the reality of these verses in your own life?
Well, we're going to look at several. The first is Psalm 103, verses 13 and 14. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. And Matthew 28, verse 20, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honour and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. How have you experienced the reality of these verses in your own life? Friday, July 29. From Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 129 and 130, we read, God has always tried his people in the furnace of affliction. It is in the heat of the furnace that the dross is separated from the true gold of the Christian character. Jesus watches the test. He knows what is needed to purify the precious metal, that it may reflect the radiance of his love. It is by close testing trials that God disciplines his servants. He sees that some have powers which may be used in the advancement of his work, and he puts these persons upon trial. In his providence, he brings them into positions that test their character. He shows them their own weaknesses and teaches them to lean upon him. Thus, his object is attained." They are educated, trained and disciplined, prepared to fulfil the grand purpose for which their powers were given them. End of quote. And from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 316. If in the providence of God we are called upon to endure trials, let us accept the cross and drink the bitter cup, remembering that it is a Father's hand that holds it to our lips. Let us trust him in the darkness as well as in the day. Can we not believe that he will give us everything that is for our good? Even in the night of affliction, how can we refuse to lift heart and voice in grateful praise when we remember the love to us expressed by the cross of Calvary? And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. One, in class, have someone recount his or her own test of faith that, if not quite as intense as Abraham's, was still hard enough. What can you learn from that person's experience from his or her successes or failures? Two, review the last 24 hours of Christ's life before his crucifixion. What extremes did he face? How did he endure? What principles can we take from his example and apply for ourselves when we are in the midst of our own crucibles? 3. Discuss the idea touched on this week about how, through our own suffering, we can minister to others who are suffering. No matter how true it might be, what are some of the problems we might encounter with this idea? And 4. Ellen G. White wrote above, Let us trust him in the darkness as well as in the day. That's easier said than done. How can we help each other develop the kind of faith that will enable us to do just that? Why is it important to trust God in the bad times? Inside Story. Our mission story continues this week with Sibella. Thank you, Sibella. Crashing a Baptism, Part 5 by Andrew McChesney. 
the day of Junior's baptism arrived. Five people, including Junior, were to be baptised at 4pm at Alpha Seventh-day Adventist Community Church in Manaus, Brazil. I won't go, Father said. Drive me to the temple. On the way to church, Mother wondered out loud whether Father might still show up in his high priestly robes from the Candoble Temple. I don't care if Father comes in all his robes, Junior said. I'll accept him. At the church, Pastor Ricardo announced that Junior would be baptised first and invited him to share his story as he stood near the baptismal pool. Junior shared how he was bullied at school and his classmates, Clifferson, had invited him to a video gamers club that sang about Jesus and discussed the Bible. When Junior finished, he waded into the baptismal pool and turned around to look at the congregation. At that moment, Father, wearing his priestly robes, entered the sanctuary. Mother burst into tears. He's here, she said. He said he wouldn't come, but he's here. Heads turned to look at the back of the hall. Mother prayed silently and church members familiar with Father's work also prayed. Others stared in amazement at Father's flowing robes. Everyone treated him with respect. A church deacon stood beside Father, greeting him. Welcome, Eduardo, said the deacon. Roberto Fernandez. We were waiting for you. Come, he led Father to the baptismal pool where Junior was waiting to be baptised. A million thoughts filled Junior's mind. God planned everything, he thought. No one knew in advance that I would be baptised first and Father arrived just as I entered the pool. God's plans are perfect. Each of the five baptisms was supposed to take ten minutes, but Junior's lasted an hour. Several friends from the Video Gamers Club stood up to praise God for Junior's decision and to encourage him to be faithful. Pastor Ricardo asked the Pathfinders to sing and everyone joined in. As Junior came out of the water, the Pathfinders joyfully waved their yellow scarves. Junior, dripping wet, hugged Father. Daddy, despite your religion, I love you very much, he said. Looking at the audience, he added, I thank you for being here, but most of all, I thank my father for being here. Then father addressed Junior, Son, I accept your religion because many supernatural things have happened, he said. I have kept you away from my religion this whole time, and I didn't want you to become involved in any religion. However, I accept your religion because I sense a supernatural energy right now. I only hope that my own path to Jesus isn't painful. As the family got into the car afterward, Father said, This is such a nice place and the people are so nice. He was beaming with joy. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.